Hare Krishna Kosta Prabhu. Welcome back Hare. to the Monks Podcast. It is my great to... pleasure to be here with you, Prabhu. Yes, thank you for joining. Well, last time we had a very broad and insightful discussion on broad Western outreach. You know, today I thought we could go deeper into a specific uh, aspect of the Western mind and your outreach. Say that okay. uh, you know, it seems that the Western mind is significantly affected by postmodernism. So, and then you are your wisdom of the sages podcast has been quite successful where you are directly teaching the bhagavatam so we could discuss about presenting bhagavatam to the postmodern mind or in the postmodern world i thought we could okay. discuss broadly that topic sure so maybe first we can start with what is postmodernism uh, that will help me <laughs> define it more clearly <laughs> okay so you know it's uh, one of the aspects of postmodernism is that it rejects all structures and definitions so in that sense it's very difficult to define okay. but uh, i I'll, i'll talk maybe i'll present in two three different ways one is that this is that modernity was characterized by rationality that we, we should be rational we should be using science as a tool scientific reason as a tool for understanding so pre modernity was characterized by revelation that the defining epistemological source of knowledge was revelation whether it is the bible or the vedas or the quran or whatever else mm, but mm-hmm. in the post modern the idea is even re- both revelation and rationality are both considered to be basically instruments of power that okay. that rash- the revelation is used by the religious people to hold power and rationality is used by those who can use it for maybe for gaining power over us you know this our idea is rational your idea is not so so their idea is that ultimately each individual is free to decide their own conception of reality so in one sense experience personal experience becomes the defining parameter for uh, for deciding what is the reality okay. so there is the concept of you know the ca- ca- truth with a capital t and truth with a small t that whether there is actually a actually a ultimate truth that is either not there or that is not knowable but each of us have our own truths it's a truth with a small t my truth your truth so you could say it's I've quite heard people subtle. speak like that sorry <laughs> i've heard people speak like that yeah so my in that truth. Yeah. very subjective and experiential but based on based on one's own experience so that's one major aspect of postmodernism uh should i go on or would you like to reflect on this no no I, I, yeah why don't you lay it out for me and this will be helpful for me okay so another aspect is also that within the postmodern context uh, people consider that any so it one way is intellectual structures but even societal structures the whole idea is everything is seen as a means for gaining power so some people say that what marx talked about as power in terms of social dynamics that all that the history of humanity is a struggle between the powerful and the powerless the haves and the have nots so that is taken into all domains of life hmm. so it's like maybe the masculine gender males are trying to dominate the females hmm? one race is trying to dominate the other race so any societal structure it may be it is seen with suspicion hmm. and especially religious organizations religious religious systems which have structures and hierarchies they are also seen with great suspicion hmm. the, the the default assumption is that this structure has been created for for gaining power okay that through this structure somebody can uh, somebody can develop competence or are go toward excellence or transcendence those are seen as secondary at all present so suspicion about structures so it, it's we could say more in, first is more in terms of epistemology how we know then the second could be more in terms of functionality that that's why we can say there is this huge crowd of spiritual but not religious so they usually associate religion with either some structure of dogmas or some structure of rituals okay. and they say i don't want those but i want to experience something higher in life so that sbnr group 
So that is uh, that is quite typical of the postmodern mind. That's that second thing about uh, structures. And third would be, broadly speaking, the postmodern mind is often more concerned with uh, <clears throat> with you could say more with feelings than facts. That if something feels good, we want to do it. So now this is not necessarily bad. It is the whole attempt for social justice is in social justice itself is not a postmodern endeavor. It is of course that is a, you could say almost a humanitarian endeavor. But anything which is seen as uh, discriminatory or unjust, there is a strong opposition to that. And sometimes in proposing solutions that. People are governed more by feelings than facts. And this sounds right, so you should do this. So now, again, I might be making some connections which not everybody would agree with. But say in America, there is this whole uh, defund the police. Mm -hmm. Agitation is there. Now, there are, of course, genuine reasons why that the genuine uh, reasons why people may have suspicion about police authority. There have been abuses of power. But for most people, you know, if there is no police, there will be chaos in society. That's their way of looking at it. But the, here the idea is, oh, the police, police are causing so much injustice. So decrease police, police, uh, decrease policing, and focus more on uh, on education, on uh, other facilities, which will bring about sustainable change in society. So, okay. so now whether just providing more education, whether providing better medication, better health facilities, and all those things. Whether that actually decreases crime, whether that uh, the, so often the facts are not examined so much, but one is driven by quite a bit by feelings. So I would say experiences, then uh, focus on experiences, then suspicion about structures, and feeling based activism. There is a zeal to do something, but it's largely feeling based. Okay. So now there could be a lot more in postmodernism, but these are three broad things I thought we could address. Does this resonate with your experience also broadly? Kind of people uh, you encounter? I definitely, yes, feel those trends in thought for sure. Yeah. That's true. And, and um, so where to start? Would, would you like me to start with, um, I guess, just some of our, some of our discoveries with Wisdom of the Sages, like what we've kind of um, experienced yes, with so people certainly. that we're connecting with, yeah? Yeah, so any of the people with any of these mindsets, if uh, you encountered them and how you presented bhakti to them or what challenges they faced in accepting bhakti and how you dealt with those, you could yeah, go that well, way also. Or you can you, you know, can go according to your thought flow. Well, in one sense, um, the Wisdom of the Sages is a, is a dialogue between myself and Raghunath and everyone yes. else is just listening, right? Of course, we do take questions once a week um, and, and they may get into these topics, but um, maybe what I would, you know, Currently, we have about 6,000 people that listen per day to, to Wisdom of the Sages. So it's like 6,000 people listening to Bhagavatam. And the interesting thing is um, that so many of them had no prior experience it until very recently. You know, for instance, a lot of people, a lot of our listeners, uh, there was a huge spike in our listenership from people from the Joe Rogan Show, which is a popular podcast yeah. that has absolutely nothing to do with spirituality, spirituality yeah. or Eastern spirituality or anything like that. But Raghunath appeared on that, spoke about Bhagavad Gita, spoke about his journey in life. And that brought that brought over a huge spike in our listenership. So that means you're dealing with someone from scratch mm. and someone, you know, that is likely in one way or another, uh, either a product of postmodern thinking or, you know, responding to postmodern thinking in some way. So mm. it's a, it's, it's a big, you know, it's a big swath of, of people, um, let, let, maybe let's start with the institution, because that's yes, yeah, always that's, interesting that's, to, right? that's important. Yeah, that's the first thing which I think we have to encounter immediately. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, my thoughts about institution have uh, maybe they've developed a little bit since doing Wisdom of the Sages. Um, it's occurred to me that well, let me put it this way. First of all, Raghunath and I, we, we speak openly, say, about ISKCON. You know, we, we talk about it. We talk about our experiences growing up in it. We don't speak in a cynical way, although sometimes we look back at it in a humorous way. Or we may you know, point out uh, 
flaws or weaknesses that were there, not so much with a with any kind of bitterness, but just like uh, as an observation, you know, again, sometimes humorously and sometimes um, to help us better understand how to how we might do things better. Mm. But uh, we try to never do it with any kind of any kind of axe to grind or some kind of cynicism or anything like that. But um, we don't we what we definitely don't do is present um, Bhagavatam or Krishna consciousness or the practice of bhakti as something that's dependent on a particular institution. Um, that that mm -hmm. that you know you 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 need to become a member of this institution in order for this to work for you or something like that. Um, and I think largely what we present is that the institution is there to bring us to the goal of the practice, which is Krishna Prema, right? It's, it's there to bring us to that stage where um, from within the heart, you know, arises that, that true nature of, of love for God and that we feel that love for, through, through feeling for that root of all existence. Uh, we feel it for, you know, every living entity who's like, you could say, a leaf on the on the trees of those of that existence. You know, for every living being, we should feel that compassion or affection in some way. And that the institution is, is designed to get you there, you know. It's not that you're meant to fall in love with the institution, but that the institution is meant to facilitate your love for God and for every living being. And um, I think that can get lost you know, uh, and maybe post my, you know, and maybe a presentation that is um, not recognized, that, that is more institutionally directed, more, you know, when the, when the, the attitude is, how are we going to get these people into the institution? How, you know, how, how do we get more members of the institution? If that's in the psyche of, of the person that's presenting it, perhaps the postmodern mind will not respond very well to it. You know, it'll be mm. sensed, it'll be understood, and it'll be so, uh, avoided. A couple of things. Thank you, Bro, for mentioning this. Sure. If you're, uh, so I also heard your podcasts uh, on your, like, your Wisdom on Sages. And uh, when, in one sense, what you're saying is that uh, you, you made that nice category that either people are influenced by postmodernism or people are uh, yeah, reacting to postmodernism also. Both both those kind of people might be there. Mm. And I'm seeing that uh, there are quite a few people who are opposing postmodernism also. Quite aggressive opposition to there is there mm. to that. So you are addressing both of those. So we could say one one group may be very strongly a defender of the institution and the other could be like a very strong critic of the institution. Mm -hmm. But what you are doing is uh, you are avoiding both of these extremes by focusing on focusing just on the message of bhakti yeah so we try to keep it there yeah <laughs> trying true. to keep it there yes not and, only not it, honestly not only as a presentation but actually as well as like within our own lives in our own practice mm -hmm. you know in, in this day or this age of polarization you know um not that i try to be aloof to social concerns but i definitely try to avoid um being swayed by the emotion that you're talking about, you know, on, on either end. True. So, uh, so the point I was making is that uh, while we are, you mentioned that you know, we don't show, we don't say that this is dependent on a particular organization. So then if we consider, uh, do we talk about standards? Say, for example, four regulatory principles or chanting a certain number of rounds. So, now, if we consider part of the tradition, there are the five potent forms of devotional service which I mentioned. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, but the specific magnitude, how much to chant is not mentioned within the tradition. That is more, we could say, associated with the institution. Sure. So, when we are teaching, can you give some examples of where or what not emphasizing the institution would mean? Does it mean that you don't tell people to visit a ISKCON temple or what, what do you mean by not emphasizing the institution? Well, I, you know, I suppose um, we we try to speak the the like. Well, for instance, you brought up okay. There are five potent forms of devotional service, mm -hmm. um, and and the understanding is there that e even one of these has such potency that if you become absorbed in it, if you absorb your mind in it, 
it's powerfully transformative. So then the question is, well, I do try to absorb my mind in it. I sit down and chant my rounds and I don't feel all the transformation that I meant to feel. Uh, okay, well then let's look at why are you, apparently you're not absorbed in it like properly, you know, like, and, and that may have to do with our attitudes. That might have to do with our lifestyle. That might have to do with our sentiments. That something's not quite lined up right now. Now, whether the institution is going to help you get there or not, in my mind, isn't so important. Like, for perhaps, perhaps like Raghunath and myself are going to help the person understand like the right conceptions or, you know, the 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 right sentiments that one needs to have when they chant that name to feel a more transformative power in it. But in one sense, you know, Raghunath and I, must, we're, we're both products of the institution, you know, so it's, it's the institutions, if, if we can help them understand that, then in one sense, the institution's done its, played its role, you know, it's, it's, you know, I was just, I was thinking recently about one statement Prabhupada made, and I, I hope I'm quoting it accurately, um, but it was more or less that at one point Prabhupada said that even if Viscon collapses, that's okay, as long as the BBT continues. Does that sound? Yes, does that yes. Ring a bell no father said that. Yeah. And so it made me think that um, that 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 was just interesting. We we you know we might be institutionalized in, in our thinking, and we may have uh, you know based on our experience, we may see that there are temples with people that live in those temples. The, and from from those temples, Krishna consciousness or bhakti will spread, um, and, and it's dependent. But is it really, or you know, could the role of those temples shift with time? Could it be that there are just people, you know, out there? They may be authors, they may be musicians, they they may play some other role in popular society, and they're reaching many people. Um, with with the message of bhakti and people are being transformed because those people are reaching them not so much people coming out of a, a particular temple and that the temple's role could be that place you go to to see Radha and Krishna in the temple <laughs> you know it's like to have darshan you know P perhaps that's where the future goes you know it, it, whoever can carry that that message effectively carry that and and um and, Sorry, and Blue, I didn't happens. get what you're saying. Can, are you saying that in a, the, the the role of the temple temple would be a base for authors and poets, or the authors and poets no. will be elsewhere, and they will encourage people to go to the temples for the darshan of the deities? Is that what yeah, you're yeah? Yeah, the 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 second one. Um, okay. In other words, I I think in the past we we saw, we've seen, maybe we still do see temples as a breeding ground. For preachers that go out into the world and change the world um yes but is it always th those people that are actually reaching the most people you know um it, it, you, you, even you know imagine if it, you know there were you know sooner or later a movie's going to come along sooner or later a, a, a musician is just like george harrison you know or the role that even Raghunath played and, and his bandmates in the band Shelter, where they were reaching so many people. Now we see someone like a Genevieve Harrison can reach, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, you know, through her music, through social media, um, you know, and others are out there and they're reaching people with these messages. Raghunath and I are surprised that actually so many people listen to Wisdom of Sages. It's, it's interesting. We feel that the message is suitable that if we were just promoted more, there are a lot, there are a lot more people that are out there that would also be willing to listen to it and, and be affected by it. So it may not be that um, people need to come to a temple to learn Krishna consciousness from the people that live inside that temple, but it may be that those temples could just be the place where you go to, uh, to see Radha and Krishna, maybe celebrate a festival. But there's people, re you know, not only reaching people with the message, but maybe even supplying them or providing them the care and assistance that they need to progress on that path, you know, through different, okay. you know, in different ways. So it seems to me like it's already moving that way. And I think uh, the, the whole lockdown with COVID and everything may have accelerated that a bit too, you know.
that's an interesting point eh? okay. yeah. yeah so the institution at least in terms of physical boundaries of the institution they have become the physical structure and the physical boundaries of the institution have significantly become downplayed because of the pandemic yeah so, yeah you know we notice it also in terms of usually a devotee would go to the local temple to hear a class but now a person can hear even if they want to hear classes regularly they can hear from anyone in any, any part of the world practically yeah okay. and i think on may perhaps unintentionally not with you know or let's say with only the best intentions but i think the institution may have had a way of holding down uh, um certain people that did have the ability to spread krishna consciousness um you know there there is a a structure there's a hierarchy and so on that that's established um and with covid you know everyone just going online it's like whoever's reaching people is going to reach people you know beautifully put huh? yeah yeah that's true so 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 it, it make, it yeah you know if shift. you want to go online uh, in an institution some people may be given opportunity to speak others may not be but in yeah. social media or through the internet anybody can speak and if people are attracted they are attracted yeah that's so true i it, i think it was it's similar like I, i'm no expert on this but i think like for instance in in like say with uh, popular music in the past it would be very difficult to get a record contract you know there there are a number of record companies that you could get a contract with um you know and they would really have control over you in terms of you know your art you know artistically and so on but you're kind of stuck with that um and, and you know there might be great talent out there but if they didn't see that talent then you were never discovered and so on but mm. in, in this age you know people can get their music out and put it up on Instagram and you know and from what i understand you know a popular musician may find a whole new path to to popularity nowadays and so maybe that there's a similar trend in terms of reaching people that's with that's true i think you know in one sense we could say this started earlier also with in publishing because now mm -hmm. we needed a publisher in the past and of course now also yes. people may choose publishers but you if you have the capacity to produce good content and you have capacity to reach people then anybody can write their own book and put it on kindle put it on amazon and reach audience yeah so that's also there yeah so in one sense we can say that it's not so much structures are being removed but structures are being redefined yeah because if yeah, you go back sense. to the point of example of amazon there are a lot of people who are concerned about say the way the ethics of employment in amazon that people are being exploited workers are not uh, they too much work is demanded they are not paid enough or whatever so we could almost say that you cannot really reject remove structures but some structures some hierarchies may become dysfunctional because of societal changes or because they no longer serve the needs as they were serving earlier mm. yeah it seems like there's always uh, you know um we tend to um choose this structure or that structure but really to really serve people requires flexibility like that just seems how the world is you know That's people crazy. argue right conservatives argue for small government liberals argue for large government but fact is it's got to be able to shift according to the circumstances you know mm, beautifully put the even if this would be a podcast what you mentioned it's a non institutional form of outreach but then even the podcast market is also it has its own hierarchy it's like somebody sure. who is at the top they will naturally get they will appear on the search engines they will they will they will spread more and yeah. because you got on uh, joe rogan uh, jagannath yeah. prabhu got on rogan rogan so that that also help you to reach a larger audience that so just, and 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 what that did it just to, to substantiate your point was by doing that we immediately also shot to number one ranked spiritual podcast on apple podcast so it it was if someone went to search for a podcast on apple podcast they would see us you know Oh, that happened okay. because we're on Joe Rogan. So yeah, it's it's it self perpetuates itself or it's like snowballs like that is true. Okay. So so yeah, that is one thing that about postmodernism, you really can't get away with structures. So it's you get mentioned about liberals them. and liberals and yeah. conservatives. 
in one sense liberals may say that oh we want to defund the police or whatever we they may oppose structures but eventually they create their own structures and sometimes their yeah. structures are quite uh, uh quite uh, quite overbearing in one sense in a we say we may say that society will not equi- capitalism will not equitably reward will not bring about social equity economic equity but then to provide uh, welfare to provide uh, bring about justice and equity you have to create a whole complex structure through which affirmative action or india reservation systems they can be accumulated so we in one sense we can't get away from structures entirely it's it's happening with wisdom of the sages right now actually because in one sense it's just been myself and raghunath hmm. but you know uh, we realize that there's a lot of people you know that are out thousands of people that want to practice bhakti and either they're kind of isolated out there or you know again even if there's an institution in you know like a, say in iskon temple or something in in their area they it may it may not appeal to them or they may not they it may alienate them in some way and so we're realizing that we actually have to provide a, a network of support for these people they're actually going to you know just listening to a podcast won't be enough you need to have someone that you can ask your questions to you need to have someone that you can share your struggles with or share your you know victories with and, and have some friendship and a little bit of mentorship and so we're reaching out now to, we're developing right as we speak and we hope to launch very soon um where people within the wisdom of the sages audience that want to practice bhakti can join reading groups online and there they would have a like a you know a, a place to not just read but also to check in with one another and share their thoughts and share their questions etc and so now you start to build a structure right and and furthermore we want to like we want to tie together all those groups and draw research from those groups as to what issues are most challenging to them to continue their, their practice you know and those may be you know psychological issues those may be relational issues they may have to do with raising a family they may have to do with depression or anxiety they may have to do with addiction uh it may have to do with institutional concerns or you know philosophical concerns um a wide variety of things that may be obstacles to people continuing the practice what we want to do is create a whole another tier in this institution you know that in a sense that we're creating that can really provide answers and content for those people so that they might be able to continue their practice better and so yeah That's in one sense the, the yeah. more that you want to help someone you, you do have to create an institution of some sort yeah in one sense you know when i was also interacting with the bhakti center and i think at that time you had also mentioned about the like the core and then the the, the cultural way people can come the yes. yoga way people can come so it was quite well structured so if we could yeah. say it's more like what you mentioned about uh you finding the structure is not so much uh, like when structures outlive their utility then we have to find their appropriate structures and flexibility flexibility yeah flexibility yeah yeah okay, so, i think so 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 if somebody say us are you iskon devotees how would you answer that someone asked me yeah say on some if i'm an iskon devotee yeah if you were introduced through the if you are speaking on the monks podcast or not on your your wisdom of the sages yeah and there if some some person who you know is quite new they come from joe rogan or something like that mm-hmm. so would you if they ask are you are you iskon member or are you iskon devotee uh, yeah i, I identify i identify with the institution sure you know okay, so you i don't, don't claim responsibility for everything that it does <laughs> right okay. but i do identify with with the uh, with the institution and and but i'm not bent on making you a part of that institution i'm i'm my i see my role is to bring the best of that institution to people rather than to necessarily exactly bring people to that institution if bringing them to that institution is going to serve that great and if it's going to hinder that well then let me just take the best from the institution and bring it to you that's nice and in in, a, in one sense the bring the best also involves a certain level of individuality you understand what is the best for sure for that person and you also yeah. you are you are doing some editing or selecting what you have experienced as the best so then yes. that is uh, so actually we could say that that's almost the responsibility of every person who is trying to share wisdom isn't it 
So it that it's not just giving the traditions wisdom, but tradition, but giving the most ac- most relevant or accessible or transformative aspect of that tradition. Yeah. <coughs> so the way you phrased it, Konsi, right now. Was this something which you, with a very nice phrasing that bring the best of the institution to the people, not bring people to the institution. So is this something which you also over a period of time realized that, okay, this is what I am doing or this is what I should be doing? Because in general within ISKCON, the idea is we get people to come to the temple. We get people to come to ISKCON. That's the, that's, yeah. that's the definition of preaching. So was this a, like a conscious decided strategy or it just subconsciously happened based on the way you were interacting with people? I think um, it was subconscious and it's becoming more conscious. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, I think the last time we spoke, we talked a little bit about my history and we mentioned yes. that um, back in 2003, I I brought an idea to Radha Swami in, about creating a cultural center in New York and he responded with enthusiasm and I said, what's the next step? And he said, you become a yoga teacher, which I had no experience or, you know, ambition to become. But that sent me out into a world that I hadn't, you know, I had been a monk for, for four, 13, 14 years prior to that. And for the first time, I really stepped out of that, even though I was regularly, like as a brahmachar, you know, involved in the world and going to rock concerts constantly to sell books or going to colleges, or, you know, but, but actually, um, it really kind of got me out of a bubble. It put me where I wasn't just, um, entering that world, but I was like making friends in that world and developing relationships in that world and learning in that world. Um, mm. and that, you know, th- honestly, I think if we want to, um, reach people, we have to understand them. And it's when you're living in your bubble, you may not even realize you're living in your bubble, but it, it, it's it's harder to understand people, at least in the field that I serve in. It was important for me, and, 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 and Raghunath also, the two of us, you know, um, were always reaching people outside, you know, always connecting with people outside, always uh, befriending people outside, always, you know, um, serving people outside of the institution. And so I think we kind of subconsciously maybe understood it in the past, but I think with Wisdom of Sages, it's becoming all the more conscious. Okay. That's true. And, uh, I mean, and that's true in the sense that I can say that uh, for me also, it is, uh, especially when I started coming from traveling toward the, toward the West, I realized that most of the Western outreach programs, which happen, they don't happen through the institution. They happen through quite often the individuals who are inspired by the institution, but that those individuals are taking some initiatives. And that's how things happen. So yeah. now, specifically, if you talk about the Bhagavatam, when mm-hmm. you're talking in the Bhagavatam, I don't really see that intrinsically the Bhagavatam talks about an institution. In fact, we could say that the idea of an institution is almost, uh, at least in religious institution, is absent within the Bhagavatam. Yeah. Or not in the Bhagavatam, like the Mahabharata or the Ramayana also. Sages, sometimes the sages step into the political institution and instruct the king and then mm. they leave. Right? They have no official position. Yeah. Yes. So one aspect, one, one thing which might be considered a religious institution, although we could say it is more of a social institution also, is the Varanashram or the caste system hmm. or how it has become or is perceived as the caste system in today's world. So is that something which uh, you address or you don't get too much into that? No, yeah, well, you can't You can't really read Bhagavatam without addressing it, you know. So yeah, we, okay. we certainly do, yeah. But, you know, the way that I understand that too, like in my own, Prabhupada had some vision for Varnashram Dharma, you know, in the Western world. Um, how that vintage vision manifests and exactly what it manifests and how long it takes to fully manifest, I don't know, you know. Um, but in my own life, uh, the wisdom of Varnashram, not necessarily the, the application or misapplication that we see in the world of it, but the wisdom of it has been to some degree applicable in my own life. And I, so I value it. 
And if I'm going to share it with someone else, I'm going to share it in that way. In other words, how a individual might benefit from 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 these teachings. For instance, uh, will you take like you know um, a Vaisha, right? What what do I understand a Vaisha to be? From from my readings, you know, certainly you know there's a description of it like caring, you know, like farming and so on, but. My understanding is that the Vaishya is not necessarily the worker on the farm, but like the owner of the farm, you know, who's employing people that are working on the farm. And uh, the Vaishya is someone that has the aptitude and the ability, the intelligence, the drive to make money. And um, I may have that aptitude, I may not. I personally, I don't. <laughs> but I know people that do. I know people that, you know, they have that they have that mind for making money and it's uh and, and that skill that mindset comes with strengths and weaknesses and i think those are patterns that we see it's you know throughout all you know globally throughout you know, different cultures and so on but that that truth um about these categories of psychology you could say it's real it's not just something that they were creating to you know, um, manipulate or something like that. But it's it's a it's a cycle. If you look at it, these are psychological patterns. And what is, for instance, what is the the weakness of someone that has that ability? Commonly, it'll be their greed, right? That you get, unless you're trained, unless you've had certain values instilled in you from from an early time, then you might see what I see like in American culture right now where people who have the ability to make a, a lot of money commonly become very callous, they become very proud. They think that the success of their life is the amount of money that they can make. So even if, I, if I'm if i worth five billion, if I'm sitting at a table with someone that's worth 10 and 20 billion, I feel um, somehow inadequate <laughs> and, and I think I need to make more money. And I'm willing to um, either I'm willing or I'm so callous that I'm unaware of the suffering that I'm causing to try to earn that money. Whereas if it was instilled into me at an early time in my life, and if I saw it in, in others, and it was clar clarified to me, that, this, that with my ability, the weakness that I should be aware of is greed. And my focus as like a goal or, or my focus towards success is not to make more money than the next person and do whatever it takes to do that. My focus is to be that person that cares very well for all their workers, right? Or that person that um, is known for giving in charity to noble causes. If that becomes instilled in my mind clearly, mm -hmm. then not only am I helping society, but I'm also helping myself progress in yoga. Because where the mind may say, make more i'm i'm going to train my mind and that's called yoga right i'm going to train my mind to serve and so i see like duty as the first step in you in mastering the mind or the first step in yoga and varnashram provides duties that are suitable for our individual psyches in a brilliant way so all that being said i'm you know how do i that's how, that's how i explain this to someone it's you know that, beautiful prabhu yeah so what it has individual yeah, it benefits the individual. It benefits the society, but maybe if it's presented that way, there's an aspect of it that appeals to the postmodern mind. Mm. So it's uh, one. It's more in terms of values, and uh, you could say the benefits that come from values. Yeah. Mm, so that's right. Yeah, that's one aspect of postmodernism uh, that it is quite utilitarian. Mm -hmm. So people are not so much interested in in philosophical spirituality as pragmatic spirituality. That sure. whether a soul exists or not, or whether God exists or not, is that people not interested in so much of a debate on that as okay, if God exists, how how is that going to make a difference in my life? Sure. So that's which is great. That that that's fair enough, right? We should be happy with that with with um like if someone opens the door like that 
then if we're not able to, to step up and explain how it benefits them as an individual and it benefits society, then we're really not worthy messengers of it. And we really don't understand it very well. Oh, they're not rather, worthy messengers. That's yeah, I, I would it. rather have someone come to me with that attitude. Like whether God exists or not, I, I'm, I'm actually not even so concerned with. I want to know how we benefit from what you're sharing. I'd rather have someone there than someone that's like religious and just like totally rejected me because it's a different religion and they can't even like see the commonality of it, you know, which might, which might be your modern or, you know, in your, your modern, uh, is that what you, when you define modernism in the beginning and you, yeah, maybe that would be their attitude. Rationality. So I, yeah. I argue about the rationality of my belief system and you argue about the rationality of your belief system. Yeah. I never thought of it in these terms that actually utilitarianism, sometimes we use that in the negative sense that, uh, but utilitarianism can actually be unifying. And we see that mm -hmm. quite a bit in the environmental movement today. That environment, because environmental concerns have brought a lot of diverse people together, religious, mm -hmm. non-religious, people from different religions also. So I had a podcast with Gaurang Prabhu where He's working, uh, ISKCON has been recognized as a FBO, they call it, faith-based organization. Yeah. And like the governmental organization, non-governmental organization, faith-based organization, they're the category. So it's interesting, utilitarianism can actually, uh, maybe I avoid the word ism, but the utilitarian approach can actually open minds and unify because people, people see the practical benefits so yeah let's yeah yeah perfect and so let's try to present the practical benefits mm. individually a, as well as socially or collectively that's true and in one sense that will also address the first concern about experience yes I, I want to experience what is what how does it feel how, what does it do yeah mm. so uh, taking this point forward if we consider see in one sense i am realizing that Although you are presenting the Bhagavatam, but you could also say that the, the Bhagavatam is in one sense the message and the Bhagavatam is also the medium for the message. Because in one sense, we, we use the book Bhagavatam to talk about a whole way of living. And not, ev not everything that we talk about the way of living is directly based on the Bhagavatam. Hmm. So, because, because, because we live in very different times as compared to the Bhagavatam's times. The times right. where the, the Bhagavatam are describing. So, taking that point forward, mm. if with respect to experiential aspect, I think the Bhakti tradition has a lot of potentials for providing experiences. The Kirtans can be immediately joyful mm. and coming in a devotee community where, where there is a healthy amount of service attitude, that can also be very, very wonderfully inspiring. Um, I agree 100%. And I think actually people are starving. There, there's a beauty in the culture. And I think okay. people, at least people that I'm, you know, that, that, that I'm um, aware of are people where I live. And so I think they're starving for that, actually. There's a, there's a beauty in the culture. There's um, obviously something um, satisfying and and even necessary in someone's life in terms of like socially uh, gathering with people that share their values and those very basic things that kind of define a community like eating together, telling stories together, playing music together, dancing together, um, preparing food together. Those things are so central and so um, well-developed and beautiful within the Bhakti culture that they also have uh, a lot of experiential power, you know, to draw someone to that path. Beautiful. So, now, if we move forward uh, in terms of experience a little bit, mm -hmm. how, what are the aspects of the experience that you find... Uh, are obstacles and what are the aspects of experience that are opportunities so in, at one level an experiential approach is good but then we also have the principle that 
that which tastes like nectar in the beginning will taste like poison in the end happiness in the mode of passion that which tastes like poison in the beginning will taste like nectar in the end happiness in the mode of goodness hmm. so there are some aspects of bhakti where the experiences may not be particularly joyful kirtan may be joyful but japa might be quite uh, quite demanding at times hmm. so hmm. how much do we emphasize consciously the experiential aspect and how do we deal with when the experiential aspects uh, turns out to be unhelpful or even harmful in some ways for a yeah, person who okay. decided whether i want to take this path okay so if i understand your question correctly um i want to share with you um what i've observed say within the 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 community of the listeners of wisdom of the sages about how experience how how a personal experience of bhakti has been positive for them and then what challenges are there in, okay. in in their personal experience and and I'm going to separate those cuz when I talk about what the challenges are and it seems that you define it in terms of the practice um but mm. particularly practices like you know when I say prat like shravanam kirtanam etc um but what I we re, we had a very interesting experience recently and that was we had our 500th episode of wisdom of sages and oh, okay. so we did something we did something we never did before which was we um it was a 2 hour podcast where we just heard from the listeners about how listening to Shrimad Bhagavatam on a daily basis has affected their lives and so we went back Amazing. and forth between okay. yeah it, it is i i recommend I really recommend that people that are interested in Bhagavatam and bhakti and and teaching bhakti or reaching people with bhakti, I recommend that they watch this episode. It's just called 500. It's our 500th episode. Oh, okay. Um it was it was a combination of our, of us reading letters that people had sent in and then people speaking live on Zoom. We went back and forth for 2 hours. Now, in almost every case, I don't know how many letters and it must have been I don't know at least 20 maybe more 30 something like that you know testimonies were shared and in practically every single case the testimony had to do with a particular challenge that this world is bringing to their life and how the philosophy how the teachings how the wisdom of the bhakti tradition empowered them to deal with it or to overcome it across the board that's what it was again and again and again so that's how i see the experience i mean there's sure there's experience in terms of kirtan you know like being in a kirtan or the experience of chanting jap or and th those are important things and we should do all that we can to provide satisfying experience in those realms but it seems to me like what's really affecting people is you helped me through bhagavatam helped me have the right mindset that i needed to have when my father passed away um before i was hearing this i would have felt certain things and i would have you know this it would have been it would have been an entirely negative and depressing experience for me but because i was hearing bhagavatam i was able to step up i was able to serve in that in that circumstance i was able to gain deeper realizations about life because my mind had been trained by hearing bhagavad gita daily you know we there's one story i share it's it's um it's almost it's it's heartbreaking for me but it's a a lady she's a friend of mine she listens every day you know and her husband um went through a motorcycle accident um it, where um he's it was about i think 10 months ago or longer that that the accident happened he's still in the hospital he's gone through 50 surgeries he lost a leg um over 50 surgeries she they had two children she was pregnant when the accident happened she's had her third child since then with her husband you know doctors have you know were telling her that he's not going to make it probably it's a long shot that he'll live then they're coming and saying oh well, maybe it looks like he'll live then they come back again and say we don't think he'll live and it's just like months and months you know of of a type of torture you know and fear and trouble you know Uh, on her own and she was just saying because i listen to bhagavatam every single day 
you know, without this, this is the thread that's that I'm holding on to and that's giving me strength and giving me sanity, you know, through the obstacles that this world is throwing at me. And again, it was it was so many. It was just like the whole thing was that it, it to me, it was a testimony as to the power of the Bhagavad Gita. And it really, in my mind, showed that if we want to reach people with this message, it can be framed this way, you know, that, that um, l you know, let us consider how we frame the message of bhakti, but that there, that there's a, um, the, the, the potential to share it, uh, perhaps the, the, the most um, effective way to share is to help people understand how it addresses the struggles that they go through in life. And when they experience that, then it's no longer just all theory. But they say, this is for real. This stuff works. <laughs> you know, these ancient texts have wisdom that transcends time and their faith increases. Beautiful. I mean, as you said, it's tragic in one sense. It's heartbreaking, but it's also beautiful in the sense that uh, um, this, is a, this is a place where you could say spiritual wisdom tangibly meets human need. Yes. And that's where transformation can be seen and can be, uh, re it can be appreciated. Mm. So, but there is this, at one level, one concern that when we focus on the practical application, there's a tendency to downplay or neglect the philosophy. So, of course, we can say that there are technical aspects of philosophy. For example, Achintya Bheda. What exactly is Achintya Bheda with Tattva? What is in India itself? There have been many, many systems of philosophy and how our tradition's philosophy is a development over from other traditions, other philosophy in the past. So we, we don't go usually also into technical aspects of the philosophy too much. But uh, is there a danger of say we becoming something like a self-help or a therapeutic a therapy therapy group hmm. um, instead of actually teaching bhakti spirituality sure <laughs> yeah and that's why like as i said before you know i think we need to be flexible um for instance you know because we're reading bhagavatam so much comes up you know we're we have to get into the theology. There's no way around it. Not that we don't want to, but you know, okay. <laughs> Lord Vishnu is appearing, and 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 the the devotees are taking his darshan and and um, offering their prayers, and it just happens again and again and again. So the you know the the, the theological aspect is is always going to be there, but we find that um, I find I think Raghunath has found that's not such. You know, perhaps this um, for a lot of people. You, you as you, when you describe the postmodern mind. You know, it it's the way that you present it. It sounds like if someone were deeply invested in this, they're pretty cynical. It sounds like you know they're pretty cynical, and and it almost sounds like it's, they're taking it to a level that's very impractical. You know, that's if, interesting if, point. You know, it's a good. Right, yeah. Like we also say that if we we call somebody a Mayavadi, but actually the number of Mayavadis are. Uh, yeah. actual hardcore mayavadis are very very few that's and right a large number of people whom we might simplistically label as mayavadis they may simply have some some influence of mayavadi conceptions yeah so i would say that yeah they're not deeply the invested not deeply invested here yeah. yeah. in fact there's a logical problem also with uh, postmodernism that you know, some people say postmodernism itself is self-contradictory because okay. one of the like the fundamental tenets of postmodernism is that there is no absolute truth. So all truths are basically truth. just instruments for uh, for gaining power. Hmm. But then the obvious counter question comes up is then isn't postmodernism also a construct for gaining power? Hmm. So yeah. because by deconstructing everything else, we the postmodern thinkers put themselves at the top. Hmm. So yeah. So yeah, I think yeah, yeah. so nobody's. People are not very, they, we could say they are influenced by it, but they're not invested in it so much. And they will be influenced also to varying degrees. Right. So, so, exactly. So, so my, at least my experience would be that there's certainly plenty of people out there, more than we're reaching, that aren't so 
that may be affected by postmodern thought, maybe influenced by it in both ways that would be um, favorable as well as unfavorable for their interest in bhakti. Um, but in either case, um, they're not so deeply invested in it that once they get enough taste of it, once they hear enough, that they begin to open up. You know, and, and this is this is what again what I've really found is that, um, and we discussed this last time we spoke too, is that you know we're reaching a lot of people say in their mid thirties to mid forties, when they've gone through the different ups and downs in life, they've given up on maybe you know maybe some of their, uh, you know at least when I was young you know I, I was more deeply invested in ideas like this, but then the practical world hits you you know. And you're trying to raise a family and you're trying to make some money and you're trying to, you know, t take care of yourselves and, and get through life. And you're dealing with some tragedies and you're dealing with some different kind of struggles. You give up on a lot of your idealism, you know, um, that you had previously. And you hit, the, you hit a stage of life where you've gone through a lot uh, and you really want to make you really want some deeper meaning in life and some deeper way to see this. And for a lot of people, bhakti is right there for them. You know, it, it's it's um, it, they're they're not so invested, and they're they're actually eager for some true wisdom in life. You know, in, in a in a true spiritual practice and a true spiritual experience. So, um, mm. I I think there's a a lot of people <laughs> like that. You know, a lot of people like that, and. Um, we we just need to expand our reach and uh, and people are eager for it. That's beautiful. In terms of uh, if I may put it this way, is that if you have a a demographic of people, so there might be certain levels of overlays which they may say, oh, I don't want to be a part of the institution. But mm -hmm. it's not that they are going to be, it's not that their mission in life is to, is tear, to down condemn, tear, tear, tear down yeah. institutions. They may have some reservations. And yeah. if the underlying concerns are addressed, then those reserv reservations may often go away and they can yeah. connect easily or with, with relatively less difficulty. Mm -hmm. You know, interesting, uh, recently, Deva Madhava Prabhu, I read something that he wrote, which was a critique of the ISKCON's disciple course, where he felt it was largely um, kind of like a pledge of allegiance to an institution. And he found that it sounds like it, that what he was describing was that he says there are many people that he's, you know, um, ministering to, I suppose you could say, that when it comes time for that, it becomes a real obstacle. You know, and maybe that's evidence of of part of what we're talking about today. That uh, of that postmodern. Oh, thinking. interesting. Yeah, yeah and that. Uh, Can you repeat exactly what you said, sir? He, that his, our disciple his, course actually reinforces the sense of identity with our identification with the institution. Is that what? Yeah. In other words, I believe, in his opinion, a, a better disciples course would be a course that that teaches shastrically what is a guru, what is a disciple, focuses on that. Uh, rather than it seems like there was a large, I'm not even so familiar with it, but it seems that there's a large element of institutional, um, what's the word I'm looking for, but like um, kind of like instilling a certain institutional consciousness um, in the pers prospective disciple. And he felt a lot of people that he was reaching were um, did not feel he, he's experienced that a lot of people that he was reaching were um, very averse to that, and, okay. and and the best response would be that they'd be like kind of like okay, I'll I'll kind of just like ignore that you know, and and other people were like I don't know if I can I don't know if I want to be involved in this you know, so he was finding that kind of uh, experience. Um, it seems to me like that that. Um, one might question, like at this point in our conversation, well, what about the Bhagavatam itself? Like, yeah. in other words, you know, is the content of the Bhagavatam problematic for the postmodern mind? You know, or maybe the better question is, is there, are there aspects of the Bhagavatam that can be highlighted 
um, for the postmodern mind that will appeal to them, you know. And I feel that there are, you know, if, if I understand postmodernism correctly. Yeah. That's interesting. Now, there are certainly aspects of Bhagavatam which are objectionable to the modern mind in terms of some of the cosmological, chronological aspects. But what about the postmodern mind? I think maybe some aspects of social justice, uh, some statements about sure. women and things like that. Mm. Yeah, the, the, well, you know, my understanding is that just the, on the, the very basis of Bhagavatam, you know, like as compared to any other Vedic literature, in one sense, the very basis of it is is suited to the postmodern mindset, in that it's a um, it's a text that's responding to you know Vyasadeva's mission when he went back you know on the order of Narada and redid the Bhagavatam right he he um, he revisited the Bhagavatam and re-edited it and represented it uh, in response to particularly to the Vedas but I suppose also to the Upanishads, right? To, to the conceptions of karma and jnana that were, that were there in the, in the previous Vedic literature. That in one sense, you know, right off the bat, um, you know, at, at, the, um, at the very start of Bhagavatam, you know, it's mentioned dharma projitata kaitavotra, you know, that, that this text is going to reject religious activity that's materially motivated right um it, it's it, in, in many ways i think we can see bhagavatam is like we're concerned only with substance here we're going and the, and the substance ultimately is divine love <laughs> you know like that's that's how i understand the whole way that the bhagavatam opens up which to me is the most really fascinating like um the connection between the first and second chapters of the first canto i find it to be like just brilliant you know just absolutely brilliant in that you had these sages who are compassionate by nature you know who who saw a dark age coming um who turned to the one amongst them that they found to be the most pure and simple as well as learned you know it wasn't this, it wasn't simply the most senior person that they sought out like you know with an institutional mindset but you know they they mentioned a sutta he's saumya you know he's he's pure and simple and therefore he was like endowed with all the the, the you know the the guyam you know like the the secrets the deeper stuff you know that not everybody that you know that just um approaches this literature has but you know because he had genuine you know qualities of simplicity and purity that he had deeper realization and then they ask you know what brings the highest shreya you know what 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 brings the highest good for people you know and what brings people to atma supersidity and so then when when uh Sutta goswami in the second chapter when he responds that it's bhakti right it's divine love it's actually you know it's actually divine love and divine love only that delivers atma supersidity that delivers complete satisfaction um and and then he qualifies it you know that that divine love should be in there should be absolutely no selfish motivation no, you could even say like no institutional motivation you know it's just like there's a purity in that that i think the postmodern mind might find appealing you know that that, that we're yes, looking I never for thought purity. Of it. it's beautifully put there yeah. yeah we're looking for 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 someone that's gen, you know not religious but spiritual right mm. they, they turn to that person that was they saw as the most deeply spiritual and then his answer okay it's bhakti and it's pure bhakti right that we're looking for and it's the way that i read that um the the second chapter of of, of the bhagavatam and, and and how it opens up and and where it goes like immediately is that he says bhakti is the way it's divine love and then almost like there's a type of um scriptural or you could say even like almost practically like institutional response to that message where the first thing is well what about renunciation right like isn't the 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 if i'm understanding upanishads right doesn't the deepest happiness in life come through the rejection you know of material 
enjoyment and the walking away, you know, from from material life. And, and in answer to that, um, you know, the response is Vasudeva, Bhagavati, Bhakti Yoga Prayojita, you know, Janayat Yasu Vairagyam Gyanam Chayadohoita Kam. That by rendering devotional service to God, to Krishna, through bhakti, divine love, one immediately acquires causeless knowledge and detachment from this world. In other words, that's not even our focus here. When you focus on the truest substance, on divine love, you don't even have to, it's like it's a byproduct that, that uh, detachment develops. And then someone might ask, okay, well, what about, you know, we were reading the Vedas. And the Vedas seem to indicate that, you know, by following Dharmashram, by following duty very nicely, that you get all the good things in life. Isn't that where happiness comes from? And then, you know, the next verse, you know, Dharma Svanus Tatav Pungsa, you know, um, that the, the occupational activities, the duties that one, the religion that one performs, right? Uh, you know, following my religious rules very nicely. Um, if they don't bring out some real substance, some real, if it doesn't approach, uh, you know, provoke attraction, you know, rati, something real and something, you know, personal experience, right? What is rati, you know, if not a, a personal experience in, in someone's own consciousness or someone's own heart? If it doesn't, if, if your religion doesn't bring you to some rati, to some genuine attraction to God, then not only is it rejected, it's, a, you know, in strong terms, shrama evi kevalam, it's completely useless. So it's like, to me, that's saying your religion is useless if it's not bringing you to a point of personal experience. Beautiful. And then the whole Bhagavatam is based off that. You know, it's just the, all the, the whole 12 cantos seems to me just like it, again and again and again. It's showing how divine love is superior to ritual, it's superior to religion, it's superior to even renunciation. You know, divine love is always the highest principle. And how we understand an individual is how deeply they've they've experienced or are realizing that. And so the Bhagavatam is throwing out again and again, like um, kind of caught in a sense cautionary, I see them as cautionary kind of um, narrations where we were, you know, someone in the religious mindset, you know, not, is prone to condemnation, you know, like that, you know, it's like, you know, whoever does the ritual right or whoever's from the community that's been trained the most or whoever, you know, is from a particular, you know, sex or gender or whoever's from a particular community, the, the religious mindset tends to go that way is like who's superior. And the Bhagavatam keeps pointing out again and again, like flipping it. No, look for the substance. Don't look at the, the structure, but look at the substance. Indra, the king of heaven, right? Like... In one sense, the leader of the devas, perhaps like the most successful religious man and um, uh, materialist, you know, religious materialist. He's, yeah. he's a person to be glorified, but Bhavagatam again and again makes a fool of him, you know. Again, it, it totally humiliates him, you know, it, it quite throughout, you know, throughout its uh, cantos. Things like that I see is like, you know, uh, messages that the, the postmodern mind might uh, embrace. Mm. So again, this brings it to your earlier point that that the structures are not denied by the Bhagavatam, but repeatedly those structures are are subordinated to their purpose. And that that is something which can appeal. In, in fact, you could say that there are so many places the Bhagavatam it, it must, inverts traditional structures. We have Ambarish Maharaj, who is a householder, a grahastha, and a, and a kshatriya, who is shown to be superior to somebody who is a who is a sannyasi and a brahmana. Mm -hmm. Similarly, yes. we have Rutrasur, who is a, technically an asura, but he is yes. shown to be superior to a deva. Like to Indra. In, so, yeah. so that way, that's beautiful. So, so, so many places, you know, maybe the, the most, I'm sorry, please go. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Right. So even the top most of people in the traditional Vedic hierarchy, they are shown to be subordinate. But one interesting point with respect to the Bhagavatam is that, that the Bhagavatam doesn't, although it uh, shows their inadequacies 
in quite strong stark terms it doesn't utterly reject the hierarchies That's that true. means although many times brahmanas are shown to be brahmanas are shown to be self serving like shukracharya was but then after that it shows that still even vamandev respects shukracharya and asks him what what was wrong with bali sacrifice bali sacrifice yeah so uh, indra is shown to be quite a power hungry and abusive kind of person in the govardhan lila but at the end he is still told to return back to his position he is not rejected condemned so it's very interesting yeah, yeah. so it's it, there's a deference to the structure in one's overall deference to the structure is maintained but at the same time the inadequacies of the structure are not denied in any way they are they are so, not we will not deny they are quite explicitly highlighted also when required so many examples right for instance um jadabarta and maharaj rahugana right like maharaj rahugana in the initially comes off as like the most arrogant type of leader right he's at the top of the power structure it, and to the point where he's become callous to those that are below him in the power structure he's he's um sarcastic you know he's arrogant uh all negative qualities and all the all the kind of qualities that the postmodern mind would you know be quick to jump all over but we see that when jadabarta who in this pastime is practically like a, a mentally disabled at least appears to be a mentally disabled person right like not even in the varnashram you know he's technically born in a brahmin family but he's like he appears to be practically a, you know like um a, a a a mentally incapable person but when he begins to speak R maharaj rahugana wakes up you know mm. the the power of his words penetrated him so although he was the villain you know at one point actually perhaps the the real lesson for us to learn uh from this leela is his the change that he went through or like how he was able to face his own ignorance and with humility um reapproach jadabarta you know from a place of humility you know that 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 and so i i like your point a lot because it's almost like um it seems to me that if i'm understanding the postmodern mind right from you that that um that cynicism is eating is eating the postmodern mind up <laughs> you know like i i don't want to get too deep into the politics of it all yeah um but it seems to me like um i can almost not identify with either side of a political issue anymore because even if i agree with with the politics on one side i often really disagree with the way that it's being approached the 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 attitude that it's actually lacking in divya gyan like and, and when i say divya gyan like if you if you go to 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 like say a um a social leader like martin luther king i see his whole approach was based on divya gyan right He was a religious. He was a, he was he was like a, a spiritual. He, he was coming from a spiritual place. He was saying that we're all equal on a spiritual level. We're all equal. Let's recognize yeah. that, and and yeah. let's base our judgments on that. You know, that's what a brahmana is supposed to do, right? Bring our mind to the the spiritual truth that we're missing, and, and highlight it. But I see a lot of the you know the the um the kind of this social um positions that people are taking on either side lack it they 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 lack that um and perhaps that's the way of the of the um that postmodern mind eating itself up so bow time again and again is it's 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 taking the, the proud and humbling them but we all need to become humbled actually <laughs> you know that bow time is trying to help us it's not just that oh you know you know the the brahmins are the enemy or or the religious leaders are the enemy or you know the kings are the, the evil kings are the enemy or no we all we all like embody those qualities you know even when we may not be a king or or a brahmana and and with we have to resp to learn to respond to our shortcomings with humility you know B perhaps the most you know if there's one leela that might uh 
best uh, appeal to the um, the mind of the the postmodern mind, or or you could say like the mind concerned with with social injustice, is the um, the story of the wives of the Brahmanas from the tenth canto. You know, we're very clearly the the you know the the husbands that who were Brahmanas and who were deeply learned, you know, trained institutionally. Um, had a position of status in society. Um, were you know were religious. Were seen as um, highly elevated religious figures in the community, where their their realization was so lacking. You know the depth of their spirituality was so lacking, and then that's contrasted with their wives, who were not trained, who were not learned, who didn't have the same status in society, but they had. The, the actual spiritual substance and, and purified consciousness, purified mm. heart and, 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 uh, and how they're glorified. And, and, but then again, we see that the, that the Brahmanas, that their husbands, it's really interesting how uh, that chapter ends where they say to hell with our learning, to hell with all our rituals, to hell with all of this stuff. What does it mean when we're missing the whole point and our wives, they saw the point. So they, they actually had that humility. But I forget exactly what it says in the like the probably like the last verse of that chapter. But it oh, it says something about their fear of kamsa. You know, like they still didn't have deep spiritual realization. Do you, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the verse. Yeah, yeah. What it of. says is that that although they appreciated the, what all they, they recognized that their wives were exalted devotees. Yeah. And they realized that they had chosen wrongly, but still they don't didn't go toward Krishna immediately. Yeah. You know, after realizing. So in one sense, they they were at a particular level and they they stayed, you could say, stuck at this, that level, even if the inadequacy or the folly of that level was exposed to them. Right. Right. Because they didn't have the spiritual substance. <laughs> too, too many years of, you know, they had the, they had the Gyan, but not the Vigyan on that level, you know, whereas the wives had the Vigyan. True, true. You know, th there, there's so much, you know, to me, honestly, where I find like some of the most interesting content um, to for my own contemplation, as well as sharing with others, really has to do with Paramatma, which Bhagavatam is going to speak so much about, you know, with with this conception of who or what is Paramatma, you know, that the, that that. That's the, the, the material world exists. The, the idea that just as the sun and its rays penetrate the universe, you know, that the mm. soul spreads its consciousness throughout the body. But that there's not only one soul in each body, but that there are two souls in each body, and, and it's their body because their consciousness is spread throughout it. And mm. so in a similar way, this universe is the body First, 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 Paramatma is Mahavishnu, right? Who's the Paramatma of the entire material world? His consciousness penetrates the entire material world. Then, from his body come unlimited universes, and within each one of those, he becomes each universe becomes his body. He's the soul of each universe, and his consciousness spreads throughout that universe. And then on the third level, Paramatma is what we usually speak of when we say Paramatma, right? Within each individual body, within that universe, he enters, as well as within every atom, right? So if I so, understand right, what you're saying is that this conception of divinity is actually far more sophisticated, as well as far more, you could say, accessible, or even attractive, we can say, uh, up, rather than, a, than the conventional religious conception of God. And even if somebody doesn't really connect with Krishna as God, the conception of Paramatma is something which can actually be appreciated by almost at a non-sectarian level. Even if somebody considers Krishna to be like a sectarian deity, yeah. but the conception of Paramatma is actually quite non-sectarian, isn't it? It is. And that's my point. That's where it goes, right? Mm. In, in other words, that the, the recognition that, that within every body, there's a soul that is of identical quality with myself. And that just as I have gone through, I should assume, I should take for granted that I've gone through countless transformations in my journey throughout the world. 
I've lived in all the different species. And within the human form, I've likely embodied many different mentalities, right? Some of them um, kinder and some of them more cruel. You know, some of them were realized and some of them were ignorant. Um, I've lived through it all, right? And now I'm currently in this body, in this circumstance, um, but a message has been shared with me to help me understand it better. If, if I have that mentality and I'm seeing the soul and the super soul within every living being, then it should, I should actually start embracing this, that this knowledge, this jnana should, should help me, reflection on this jnana, continued reflection, daily reflection on this jnana, can mature into vijnana, where I actually begin to feel genuine affection or compassion for every living being. And when I stand in their presence, I'm not seeing just them, but I'm seeing God within that same body and how my consciousness stays elevated due to that faith and that, that insight. To me, this right here, you know, right here is where you really have a, um, an idea that's truly revolutionary. You know, that, 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 that in a, a real substantial way addresses our social ills. And, and it begins to expand that, you know, addressing our social problems has to do with our, our circles are too tight, right? You know, going from like one family exploiting another family to one race exploiting another race to one nation exploiting another nation. Um, to, to us as a, as a nation or as a corporation exploiting the earth, you know, and then to us, you know, as a species exploiting other species, causing, you know, incalculable pain and harm. Mm. Uh, th that with this, with this conception of the soul and the super soul within every body, um, and the sacredness of that energy as unique from material energy, there, there, this is a revolutionary idea that really, from this platform of understanding, we, we could really get somewhere. You know, we could, we could, and, and when we ignore this, even in, in our, if, if we are ignorant of this, then even our sincere endeavors for justice or equality um, will, will do fail. They, they do fail. Mm. So I, 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 I feel like in my own personal spiritual life, the need and, and I feel a bit of urgency to understand this more deeply, um, to, to become conscious of it at every moment. Uh, I was speaking this morning on, on Wisdom of the Sages about an experience I had recently where I was in Colombia and a friend of mine and I went to a river. We're on the bank of the river. We're going to go swimming in it. And uh, there was a, a few people there and they had a pit bull, you know, like a potentially very dangerous dog. I don't know. Th I don't think they have pit bulls in India, do they? No, not really. Okay, but you know what it is? Is it a bull which is used for riding or wrestling or something like that? No, no, no. It's it's a dog, but a very oh. muscular and powerful dog. Okay. And uh, they're often used for as guard dogs and and so on. Um, and so this person had a pit bull, this dog, and it was off the leash. And it was in the water, and as I was approaching the water, it was coming right at me, you know. And and in that moment, I was thinking, like, you know, of the sages that wander in the forest, you know, the sannyasi, right, who puts themselves in Krishna's hands, right? And when they encounter a tiger or a snake, a cobra or whatever it may be, you know, it's not just that they're looking at that animal and thinking there's a stranger inside that body, that doesn't know me, that has no affection for me, and I, I have no idea how they're going to respond. But they're, they're even more so they're responding to the Paramatma in that body, and think there is a person in that body that's my friend, you know, that knows me and loves me, and that I have a relationship with, you know. Now, if we can see everybody with that kind of vision. You transform your own consciousness individually and you transform, you know, communities and nations with that knowledge. And I think my understanding of what Srila Prabhupada wanted us to do was to share this divya jnana, right? To share this. This is 
let's let's if we're talking about like I'm not religious but I'm spiritual well then the first question is define spiritual and to me this is what spirituality is right this is where spirituality becomes very practical even setting aside the theological aspects about it but just the very practical um, ideas that are presented there that within every body that there's the soul which spreads its consciousness throughout this body and then there's the paramatma wh whose consciousness is spread everywhere in one sense every you know he is in everything and everything is in him it through mm. through through the different stages of the paramatma this is spirituality in my mind and in, and in my mind this is a type of spirituality which could be very appealing uh in, in a postmodern world this is so true bro. somehow the concept of the super soul we could say that we have really uh underutilized it hugely yeah because i i don't know why i never thought about it the idea of tuning your consciousness receiving some higher wisdom and uh, there is a lot that goes on in today's world uh, there are several books which are which people the authors say that we are simply instruments and there are some higher beings who are writing these books through us mm -hmm. so so now of course whether there are higher beings or not that could be a debated issue, debatable issue but the point is that tuning into some higher wisdom tuning into some divine presence uh, or some higher presence people are quite open to that especially if they can learn something from it so both in terms of the the concept, this concept of Paramatma is non-sectarian, and both in terms of and in terms of interaction, so we infuse every living being with uh, with the dignity because of the divine presence, yes. and then we interact with them also in a more of a mood of learning. We look at ourselves also in a uh, more holistic way, more healthier way, because we see ourselves as parts of the divine. So. So, so do you have, do you, now of course in the Bhagavatam, you cannot downplay or deny Krishna. He's directly there. There are very clear and no personal question. manifestations of the divine. Now there are some, maybe this is the last one or two questions we'll discuss. So there are some okay. teachers uh, or some, you could say, Indi Indic scholars or Hindu scholars, they say that the potential for yoga, not just yoga practice, but even yoga philosophy, to reach a broader audience is greater because it does not have a sectarian deity within it. It has these states of consciousness and then you can you can go dhan, dharan, samadhi. So the entire process seems much more objective and non-sectarian. Not objective, you could say, at least it seems much more non-sectarian. Whereas bhakti yoga seems quite sectarian because we are focusing on a particular deity, a particular conception of that deity. So... So, have you faced any challenge in presenting Krishna as God? Or how do you deal with that? Well, we do present Krishna as God. And and, and we find, you know, it, it may turn some people off, but we've found that there's a lot of people that it doesn't. But I, I, I think it's a great uh, focus that, that you brought this to. You know, because there t there's, one might say that, and there's some truth in that. Um, and I want to address that in a moment. But the first thing I'll say is there's another side to it, too. There's a beauty in bhakti. Um, there's a cultural beauty in bhakti that's very satisfying, you know, that people are looking for, which is missing from, from a more, you know, let, let's, I'm not sure, you know, what term you would, you would want to use, but from like a purely yogic perspective. You know, the depth of the beauty that's in bhakti is appealing. No question. So that's one thing. Um, you know, what, what to speak of when you have a family and you have children and, and, and you know, like that, you know, the, the festivals and, and, and um, the, the beauty in the culture, the beauty in the music and, and the, you know, in the kirtan, et cetera, the beauty in the temple worship. Like all of these things have a very wide appeal, I find. But aside from that, I appreciate what you're saying. And my point is this, that and I think we discussed this when we spoke last time too, let's separate the esoteric aspect of bhakti. Mm. Let's, 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 let's take that and let's, and, and I'll, I'll say Krishna as a person, you know, Bhagavan, 
let's categorize that as the esoteric aspect of yoga. And, and, and we'll put that there for people that want it. You know, when you're ready for that, if you feel you're eager for that, we're going we're gonna to present that to you in context of the more, I don't know if practical is the right word, or more tangible, the, the more rational, let's say rational um, side of, not that I'm saying that it's irrational, but it might seem irrational to people. Hmm. So then let's, let's, this idea of, for instance, Paramatma, and the idea of becoming the sage of steady mind. Let's let present spirituality in, in, in these terms, right? What, but so much Gita is about samadvam, even-mindedness, you know, um, again and again throughout the chapters. So much Bhagavad Gita is about samadarshana, you know, seeing equally, seeing the super soul and the soul in every living being. Again and again, we come across this, you know, and so much of Gita is about, um, you know, what it's different terms used, but let's say antasuka, right? Like that happiness is within, that happiness doesn't come from anything external. I like to use those terms to define spirituality, right? That, that, that I, I'm, um, no matter what the externals, you know, are, whether there's ups or downs, I realize that that's how the material world moves. And, and I've learned to come to terms with that and not be shaken by that, you know, samatvam. Samatvam yoga uchate, Krishna is going to say, right? Such even-mindedness is yoga. And then Krishna is going to speak about, you know, beautiful section of the Bhagavad Gita is you take about uh, 518 through about 526 or 27. You know, all three of these aspects are touched upon there. You know, seeing God in every living being, realizing that uh, finding all my happiness internally rather than chasing it externally, you know, and having an even mind under all different circumstances. And then it'll even go on to say, and then one who... Uh, goes on to like care or serve for every living being, you know. This is I, I see. This is a very practical, um, in other words, very approachable definition of spirituality. Amazing. Uh, this is the Stita Dear Muni, and, and 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 now this is the key. This is how I tie it all together. I think I've underestimated that, even though Bhagavad Gita is constantly going on about it, right? For the religious or the esoteric, and and but when I go back to the Gita, like. You want to bring Krishna into the picture. Who is dear to if 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 our the esoteric goal of our bhakti practice is to become dear to Krishna? Well, the Gita is going to again. Krishna is going to say himself. You know, who's dear to me? One who is not envious, but is a kind friend to every living entity. You know, mm. one who does not think of themselves as the proprietor. You know, but free from false ego. Who is equal in both happiness and distress? Who is tolerant? Always satisfied self-controlled in you know one who who by whom no one is put into difficulty and who is not disturbed by anyone right you know this is you know trinata p this you know it's it's right there in the gita it's 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 the it's vigyana it's the um it's the embodiment of knowledge so this is again of spiritual both, knowledge sorry to interview this is yeah. both Universal and practical. All these yes. three points. You know, both of these are there in it. Exactly. Uh, Universal in, for the individual and and for for the broader society, the benefits are there. But yeah. but this is my point. But I understand now to get to the esoteric point, it's like these aren't even although these are glorious and beautiful, it's not even the goal themselves. But this is the platform from which you can approach Bhagavan, right? In other words, mm. if you haven't developed genuine even-mindedness, genuine detachment, if you can't see God in everyone, you're not, your mind will be in a state of disturbance. You, you will, if you're searching for happiness externally, you, your mind will be disturbed and not capable of deep absorption. And it's that deep absorption in Krishna's name, form, qualities, and pastimes that 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 facilitate uh, the 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 um, arising of Krishna Prem. You know, it's when we it's not just when we chant the name, or when we chant the syllables of the name, but it's actually when our mind is deeply absorbed in the Shudanama, right? That 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 um, Prema arises in the heart. And so, it, it, my idea of spirituality in my own life is a, is a focus on 
you know, on these qualities uh, that are given in Bhagavad Gita. Um, not only because I want them to be happier in this world, and not only because I think they serve society well, but also because they're the key to deep um, absorption in, in Krishna's name, form, qualities, and pastimes, which from which one develops love for Krishna. Wonderful. In one sense, we could also say that this is Sattva before we come to Shuddha Sattva. Yes. And uh, Sattva is actually, Sattva is actually for most thoughtful people, it is appealing. Yes. Even people who are in Rajas, they may, they may not necessarily, their idols may also be in Rajas, but still they appreciate Sattva in yes. general, unless a person is really very heavily influenced by Tamas. So, you, you know, in all those verses from the 12th chapter, at the end of the 12th chapter, it, it's saying, it also says one who's engaged in my service. <laughs> so that's there. Yeah. So I'm not ignoring that. But he's, he didn't have to say all these things. You know, Krishna didn't have to say all these things. But mm. this is what endears one to Krishna, he says himself. That's true. That's a very emphatic chapter, in fact, in the sense that, that section, that Krishna is not saying directly that one who chants my holy names or one who worships my deities is dear to me. This is, of course, true, but there he's focusing on one who is, you know, one who is not disturbed by others or one who doesn't disturb others. That's equanimity. Yeah. So yeah. that's true, not a P. You know, that, that's yeah. right, right. You know, I show all respect to others. I don't need any respect for myself. You know, I'm tolerant. Mm. I'm humble. That, that's, that's, um, amazing. That's our, you know, as Srila Bhakti said on the Saraswati, said, that's our Siddha Pranali. You know, that is our, our path to the perfection of Krishna Prem. But it's appealing, you know. But if you stick, if you stick Krishna fully into the picture too early, or if you don't gain the faith of someone um, prior to that, then they're, they're likely to respond to it. You know, uh, th they're incapable of accepting it. But if we can really present people, you know, knowledge of Paramatma, you know, it, it indicate the, the, again the, the individual and the and the universal uh, benefits of it. You know, and the qualities that that the, that one who sees Paramatma develops all these sattvic qualities. Um, mm. We can gain their faith, and then when we say, "But the yogis did this not just for peace itself, but they did it because there's a far greater treasure." Okay, now I'm willing to hear what is that treasure, and that's Bhagavan. Beautiful. This is amazing. This is quite this. I would say amazing and striking. Can you repeat the three things? One is even-mindedness, equanimity. The second, I, I, these are three things everyone. I pulled out of Gita. But you know, divinity uh, in everyone. But, what is the third thing? Divinity yeah, so samadvam, samadharshana. Divinity, equanimity, and what was the third one? Uh, antasuka, happiness within. Inner happiness. Oh, yeah. Inner happiness. Yeah. That's true. This is uh, antas. So I was thinking about. Inner happiness also, you can talk a little bit about finding meaning and purpose in life. It's not just inner happiness in terms of you know, remembering God and being internally happy. But if we are aligned with our nature, if we are doing what is natural for us, that also itself brings happiness in life. So to find our meaning and purpose in our lives. Sure. There's a lot that can be uh, connected this way. It's almost as if uh, the the Bhagavad Gita contains so many nuggets of wisdom and we just, it's almost like we have, we have to uh, pick up or, you know, this idea of there are jewels which are, there are sacred stones or precious stones which are, which are precious for everyone. Mm. But there are, you can say there are also some certain stones or certain things which are valued in particular traditions particular mm -hmm. cultures. So we could say that the Bhagavad Gita has some truths. It is like a it is like a ocean filled with jewels or a ore filled with precious substances. Now different people could be attracted to different substances within that ore. Yeah. So it is for us to find okay, will this be attracted to this person? Will this be attracted to this person? Yeah. And then we take that and provide that and then they will be attracted to the whole ore eventually because we are connecting them to the ore ultimately. But they may not themselves go into that door. So we have to take it out and show them what is there. What is there yeah. in it for them. Yeah. Then so, they develop on their own. You know, if the faith thing, if if they develop that faith, then they want more, you know. Let me let me read these few verses, Prabhu. And let's think about if these would appeal to a postmodern mind. Okay. 
Yeah, sure. Beginning at text 18 in the fifth chapter, the humble sages, by virtue of true knowledge, see with equal vision a learned and gentle brahmana, a cow, an elephant, a dog eater, and an outcast. Those whose minds are established in sameness and equanimity have already conquered the conditions of birth and death. They are flawless like Brahman, and thus they are already situated in Brahman. A person who neither rejoices upon achieving something pleasant nor laments upon obtaining something unpleasant, who is self-intelligent, who is unbewildered, and who knows the science of God is already situated in transcendence. Such a liberated person is not attracted to material sense pleasure, but is always in trance, enjoying the pleasure within. In this way, the self-realized person enjoys unlimited happiness, for they concentrate on the Supreme. An intelligent person does not take part in the sources of misery, which are due to contact with the material senses. Such pleasures have a beginning and an end, and so the wise person does not delight in them. Before giving up the present body, if one is able to tolerate the urges of the material senses and check the forces of desire and anger, they will all situated and happy in this world. One whose happiness is within, who is active and rejoices within, and whose aim is inward, is actually the perfect mystic. They are liberated in the Supreme, and they ultimately attain the Supreme. Those who are beyond the dualities that arise from doubts, whose minds are engaged within, who are always busy working for the welfare of all living beings, and who are free from all sins, achieve liberation in the Supreme. Those who are free from anger and all material desires, who are self-realized, self-disciplined, and constantly endeavoring for perfection, are assured liberation in the Supreme in the very near future. So to me, like this is, you know, this is, I don't know if you know the American word, but like we call it the sweet spot. You know, like this is sweet where spot, you, can, yeah. you, know, you can really get some traction right here. You know, like in baseball, you, you have cricket there. But in baseball, you know, the bat is shaped, it keeps getting like wider as it goes. And there's a point near, not the very end, but near the end that they call the sweet spot. If you hit the ball with that part of the bat, it really flies. So I think these kind of areas are sweet spots, you know, where we can appeal to that postmodern mind. And if you gain someone's faith on that level, they're not so deeply invested in postmodern thought that, that they won't be able to, to take the further steps. They'll even become eager to take those further steps. Uh, Pandita Samadarshina is a verse which 518 is something which have, I always talked about. But yeah. that whole section is so beautiful. I didn't realize it that. Five, it's, you, you went from 518 to 526? I think or, I went to 527. 27, yeah. Yeah. That's oh, no, 526. 526. Yeah. yeah. I think 27, 28 talks about the, it's a summary of the previous next chapter. That's right. About yoga. Yeah. yeah. So. I was thinking maybe, you know, there's this, these verses which are, which are relatively non-sectarian or appealing. Maybe these these sections from our scriptures could be highlighted, and we we could even make uh, small booklets or like focus podcasts based on these themes specifically, hmm. which could actually appeal to people. So I think there's no one better qualified than you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you're uh, prolific and in this actually kind of in my Gita daily writings I have been addressing these topics but I don't yeah. uh, I am not so sure whether I actually analyzed it in those terms hmm. but this will be very helpful for me I'll definitely work on this right um, okay so do you see this as a uh, maybe one last question here when we talk hmm. about these themes do you use the word God or use the word Krishna when you're talking about, or it depends on the context? Does the well, word God know, have a negative connotation or I not, not much? I think it, it can. Um, but again, it's like, I, I like for with Wisdom of the Sages, I feel like um, you can kind of earn a certain uh, faith in a listener that Hmm. at a certain you know they, they become ready to hear it if they're going to hear it within a broader context it's making sense they'll people will be more open to it but yeah I, I think that word can be challenged we don't always use that word a lot of times when we refer to god or rather than saying god we you know it was just 
uh, today we came across a verse. It was Kardamamuni praying to Lord Vishnu. He's doing his meditation, and then Lord Vishnu descends on Guru Ruda. And Kardamamuni refers to him, I believe the term was Ashesha Mula, which you know, literally means like the, the root of everything. And um, commonly we'll ref when we refer to God, we'll use a term that kind of highlights this aspect, right? In other words, why God? Because God is the root of everything. So in other words, we'll say, rather than saying, we, we'll say connect with God, but sometimes we'll, you know, or maybe even more often we'll say like, connect with that design, divine source, that root of everything, because now you're tying it into why. You're not, not just, you know, just surrender to this being, but you're surrendering to this being because they are the root of all existence. Because when that being is attended to, when that being is served, you're actually serving, as when you serve a root, you're serving every branch and leaf and, and twig and flower. So that, therefore, we reconnect, you know, with, with that, with that ashesh jamulam, with the, the source of everything. So sometimes we, if we if we don't use that term, we try to speak in those terms, because it makes more sense of it. Beautiful. I don't know. I'm somewhat overusing the word beautiful today, but I'm really <laughs> appreciating that. Uh, yeah. It's so much is uh, there, which is in one sense overlooked. Yeah, this is this is right here. There's a, there's a, what is that phrase in English? I think hidden in plain sight. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, so Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. So yeah. much of it. Yeah. I think we, we, we um, there, there are aspects, that when, when we become a little institutionalized, we think what appeals to us appeals to everyone. Even like, say, the missionary aspect of Krishna consciousness, that doesn't appeal to external people so much, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, we're spreading this all over the world, you know, like, they don't care. They want to know, like, what's, what does this do for my life? You know, is it genuine? You know, so many things spread around the world. It's, that's not, you know, so like, or, or, or the, or the, the more theological or esoteric things like, well, Krishna is God, you know, that's not so appealing to someone, but a, a lot of the stuff that we've been speaking about today, I think that is our sweet spot, you know? Yeah. And, and as you're saying, it is hidden in plain sight. It's right there. Paramatma. Come on. How many, how many verses are mentioned Paramatma or talk about Paramatma in the Bhagavad Gita? You know, there's only 700 verses. And again, even right at the very end, it's coming down to that. Surrender unto him, surrender unto him utterly, O Arjuna. You know, uh, it's so many places. And, and what to speak of even mindedness, Samadvam, it's just again and again and again in the Gita. So these, I understand these things as very important, you know, important for our own practice. And, uh, and, and they are that platform that, that people find uh, meaningful or appealing in their in their life. True. So, <clears throat> should I try to summarize too, or are there some? Always, I I always enjoy your your summaries. I'm not sure that I'll be able to do it so well today. We did discuss a lot of topics, but let's try. You can always add things. Okay. So we discussed about at the relevance uh, or of the Bhagavatam or presenting the Bhagavatam to a postmodern audience, and. Uh, so postmodernism has many aspects, but I started by talking about three things. It's experiential emphasis. And then it's, uh, it's opposition to structures. And it's, uh, it's structures in general and specifically religious structures. And then it's emphasis on feelings as basis for deciding things as compared to facts. So I think we discussed, started with the first discussion, structures and institutions. Mm -hmm. So... We don't have to be anti-institutional. We don't have to be pro-institutional. We can, we, we do rather than thinking that we have to get people to the institution, we can get the best of the institution to the people and thus help them move onward in their journey. And uh, it's not that even if we say the, the Western world is influenced by postmodernism, it's not that people are heavily emotionally invested in it. There might be some starting misconceptions and if those are addressed, then they can take up the practice of bhakti. So we discussed about Varanashram as an institution and as a religious, not, there are not many institutions directly mentioned in the Bhagavatam, but if we say Varanashram is one, then rather than going into the technicalities, we can talk about the values 
what are the values that will guide particular members of society and then if we can we can present the benefits or the u- utility of uh, of particular teachings then that can appeal and that can mm, that can actually go beyond boundaries or walls that might divide or obstruct so being utilitarian it is not necessarily bad in fact it can be more unifying because somebody somebody is too theologically bound then they may it may be difficult to bring them together also so while being utilitarian it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we have to simply go into self help because we are directly speaking based on the bhagavatam itself so then <clears throat> with respect to the another point about the religious structures or structures as being tools of power we discussed about how the bhagavatam repeatedly uh, shows the inadequacies of the structures whether it is conceptual structures like vairagya and gyana or even institutional structures like uh, the position of the devatas above the manavas or the position of the of the brahman pat- the brahman patnis as being as being more evolved more spiritually evolved in the brahmanas their husbands in so many places like that so the hierarchy the conventional hierarchies are not rejected completely but their limitations are also sufficient are 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 you could say unhesitatingly pointed out yeah and then i think uh, the last part which uh, so the this concept of paramatma uh, was is something which is uh, which can be uni- which can be so broadly appealing so even if somebody can consider krishna to be a little bit of a sectarian god but paramatma god's presence within the world within our own heart that is something which can be universally appealing and and that appeal is both in uh, we talk about universal and practical that we this this is not sectarian this is something which people can relate with and pers- it's practical in the sense that people it can change the way people act so three points you mentioned about anta sukha samatva and did you use any sanskrit word for paramatma itself you can use the word divinity within divinity within everyone else so becoming even minded and finding happiness within so these are sections of the gita and these are also emphasized within the bhagavatam quite often and yeah so rather than rather than thinking that we have to say learn something new to attract people to to the bhakti it's like we go we look at what we have itself from new eyes or based on our own experience our so you mentioned earlier a point that if we don't interact with people practically then sometimes we 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 don't realize which structures need to be revised which so it's mm. not the structure that we rejected but structures have to be revised so that they serve the purpose so that if we actually interact with people and then we can learn a lot and uh, about how to present your experiences about how this lady who her husband passed away after multiple surgeries and how the bhagwa he hasn't passed away. passed away he hasn't passed away fortunately oh sorry sorry he's still alive <laughs> multiple surgeries okay see I, I, you mentioned had an accident yeah, yeah. okay you had an accident and multiple surgeries but this is help to cope with it so where we can show how spiritual wisdom meets human needs that's where it can mm-hmm. transform and within the bhagavatam there are so we if we consider the bhagavatam to be like a well spring of wisdom a mine so based on our understanding of interacting with people our understanding of the bhagavatam we can find out those nuggets within the bhagavatam which are uh, which are going to appeal to different people and serve their needs mm-hmm. and so overall present the exoteric before the esoteric mm-hmm. so we don't deny the esoteric but the exoteric in terms of the the, the sattva the sattvic values which everybody can appreciate which can add quality add value to everybody's lives so when they get that then they naturally become eager to explore further also hmm. so any other points you would like to add no please? that was <laughs> that was a great summary for you thank you very much <laughs> wonderful bro <laughs> you know i thought um i was thinking there was one story that i thought we might share today but we uh it, it didn't come up but you know it it's it it seems like the bhagavatam is again and again kind of the 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 tales that it shares are cautionary like in other words if i want to if i want to be a sadhu the type that pleases krishna the type that has deeper insight 
the type that has the mind that's able to become deeply absorbed, so much of it has to do with how I honor every living being and avoid uh, the, the dangers of, of institutional thought or religious thought wherein, wherein one becomes prone to condemning others. And the Bhagavatam is going to show, you know, like, you know, Judah Bard is condemned and then he's proved to be superior. You know, um, mm. uh, Richard Sewer is a demon, but he's proved to be superior to the religious man. You know, Daksha, particularly Daksha, you know, like another, like the, the you know, the, 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 the incredibly successful and exalted religious figure, you know, he's, he condemns Narda, who's superior in his devotion, you know, and uh, he condemns Shiva, who appears externally to be such a, um, a tamasic person, you know, Shh. and in that, that Leela, you know, the, where Sati, you know, um, takes her own life. That is an incredible story. It's, it's maybe one of the most entertaining passages in the entire body. And, it, you know, it, I think it takes up about four chapters. Or so. But that's in that chapter, like all the religious people, like, the, the, you know, the, the, these high level religious leaders, they're all exposed as, as lacking in, in, the, in the depth of their vision. And again, in this one, all the women are the ones that turn out to be correct in the end, you know, like the big men, spiritual leaders, you know, the, 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 their, their lack of, they, they all become embarrassed and humiliated. And it's the women actually, you know, in, in, a, in a couple of men like Brahma and Shiva himself that actually, um, that, that actually come out of that entire story, you know, like um, with, their, with their reputation intact. But I always, I just want to share one thing with you. And this is what I think, I, I, I've, I read this verse and when I read it, I said, I think this is um, maybe the funniest joke in the entire Bhagavatam. Joke, okay. okay. It's a joke. It seems to me like it's got to be a joke, right? Where, you know, there's so much, you know, um, Daksha, his own daughter comes to his sacrifice, but he's so deeply absorbed in his, his, his materialistic external condemnation of her husband, Lord Shiva, that he's incapable of even welcoming his daughter with affection, right? That's how hardened he's become by his religion. And, um, and you know, the, the wife gets it. No, we should welcome our daughter. She's not, she hasn't been hardened by, by religion in this way, you know? And, um, but anyway, the, the way that, that um, you know, then, then uh, Daksha, who's already in previous chapters, totally condemned Lord Shiva, you know, offended him, you know, with horrible statements, totally misunderstanding who he is, totally judging him externally, not understanding him internally. He, he goes on and, and further insults Shiva. She takes her life because she can't bear, right? This, this woman is of such integrity that she can't bear being in a body that's related to this offender of such a great soul. And so she takes her own life, you know, in this, uh, you know, in, in, in her own self, you know, emulation, you know, she sets fire to herself, like, uh, through yoga. And then the whole, and then all of Lord Shiva's very tamasic followers just make a complete mess out of everything, including the cutting off of the head of Daksha. And then all of these religious figures, they have to go to Lord Brahma, who's the only one with a cool enough head to, he's, he's so deeply situated, you know, in, in, in um, dharma and righteousness that he recognizes, you've all offended a pure devotee, Lord Shiva. You're judging him externally when actually you don't understand who he really is. You need to go and apologize to him. So they all go and apologize to Lord Shiva. And um, Lord Shiva doesn't see friends and enemies, and he accepts their apology. And then they begin to perform the sacrifice again. Uh, it clean up the, all the mess that's been created by their institutional, narrow-minded, external religious thought. They, they put everything back together. And then Lord Vishnu, at the end of the, the sacrifice, he appears. And then every individual begins to offer prayers to Lord Vishnu. You know, Lord Shiva offers prayers. Lord Brahma offers prayers. Daksha himself offers prayers. The different sages, the different priests, the, the wives of the priests, everyone offers their prayers. And then the wife of Daksha offers a prayer. Okay? 
And I would imagine it would be very likely that she's standing right next to Daksha himself. She's saying this prayer. And her husband now has the head of a goat. <laughs> right? <laughs> and and, and she, this is what Daksha, Daksha's wife prays. She says, My dear Lord, it is very fortunate. Think of the depth of her conscience, all that she's just been through and witnessed and everything, but her devotion is intact, you know, and, and her realization is intact. She says, My dear Lord, it is very fortunate that you have appeared in this arena of sacrifice. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you, and I request that you be pleased on this occasion. The sacrificial arena is not beautiful without you, just as the body is not beautiful without a head. <laughs> and she, she could have been pointing to Daksha, like right next to her. <laughs> oh, God. Of all the things that she could have said, she, she says that the sacrificial arena is not beautiful without, Krishna, without Vishnu, just as a body is not beautiful without a head. So in any case, that's just another example of where those that um, who who have status based institution you know and institutional pride they become humbled again and again and again in Bhagavatam and it's always those with genuine divine love that are exalted in Bhagavatam and hopefully that message is is appealing to the people of it and I think it is I've, I've, I think that message is and we just need to highlight it that's all it's beautiful you know maybe in the future, we can go over specific pastimes and discuss. Yeah, this would be, it would be Let's do time it. intensive, but it would be wonderful to I analyze to some it. major pastimes. I did a, I've also been teach, uh, doing Bhagavatam applied sort of series where I'm trying to look at the Bhagavatam from contemporary perspectives. So I, I did an elaborate uh, series on this Daksha pastime. I had focused mm. more on the theme of conflict resolution and how okay. conflicts escalate and how they can be avoided. But yeah. this theme of what are the words you say? Status, no, institution based status or yeah. pride, institutional based derived is, you know, that, that is so true. And uh, oh, in one sense, the postmodern mind gets a special pleasure in seeing the, in seeing the high and mighty fall. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> everybody can get, a, everybody can get a little pleasure in that, but the postmodern mind delights in that. Yes. <laughs> there's, so, there's so much in the Bhagavad Gita. So Bhagavatam is full of it. <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> so, thank you, Prabhu. It's a wonderful discussion. I so much enjoyed spending this time with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Look forward to having, some, having you again in future also soon. And I look forward thank to bringing you back on Wisdom of the Sages. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna.